right, hello, welcome. Welcome to this Q&A. Thank you for joining. Um, please let me know if you have any questions uh, in the chat. I will go through a few different uh, things today involving uh, technique and learning pieces and uh, harmony. And any questions that you might have on the spot, feel free to, to let me know. So um, I thought I could start with a little piece that I've been practicing. i um, not sure if you saw my fugue post that I did on YouTube recently. Um, fugue from Sweet BWV 997. A really beautiful one. This, um, I thought I'd play the first movement for you, just as a bit of a, you know, um, housewarming for you for joining. So, um, this is one of my favorite suites by Bach, uh, 997, originally in C minor. I do like to put the capo on to the second fret, which puts it in B minor. So we're getting closer to the original key. Um, but it's very often played in A minor without the capo. So here's the first movement, the prelude.
well, we've got a couple of questions already here in the chat. So um, the piece is in A major with a double cross. Is this a double chop? Okay, so you've got a piece in A major and you see a cross in the score next to a G. See, that's, that's probably a G double sharp, actually. Um, not a G sharp. So if you see a cross looking symbol next to a note, it's probably a G double sharp. So that means um, if you play G in the third fret, G sharp will be here. And then G double sharp will be here, which would be the same as A. So I don't know, I would have to probably see the actual score to see, um, to know exactly what that is. I don't know if it's in A major, I don't know why there would be a G double sharp in it because that's actually the same as a, as an A. So I'd have to, if you know, if you, if you wanted to send me the, send me the score, I'd be happy to have a look and let you know specifically what that is. Artificial harmonics and how to play them. So thanks for the questions here, Frank. So artificial harmonics are achieved by planting your, well, you know, fretting the notes with your left hand as you would normally. But then with the right hand, you find 12 notes above the note you're fretting. So if you, let's say you do A on the third string here, you fret that as you would normally. Then you want to find 12 frets uh, above that note and with your right hand you're going to um, gently touch that spot now I can show you a nice close-up here so let me get this um, so with my right hand so that's the 12th fret there so um, that's the 13th fret which would be G sharp which would be the same as the first fret with the left hand and then this is the 14th fret so that would be matching up with my left hand playing a that's actually an a as well so if i play that note that's an a as well okay so i fret the a down here as i would normally and then with my right hand i touch that a up an octave higher 12 frets higher um, and then with my a finger I'm going to do that. So I'm going, I'm touching the fret with my index finger and then with my A finger, I'm plucking and at the same time, lifting the index finger up. There's a beautiful passage in um, Sakura Variations, which is using, which uses artificial harmonics um, the whole way through, like something like this. I haven't played it for a long time, but um, I'll show you that up close. So that looks like this. So that's a brief overview of artificial harmonics. If you want to get started learning the technique, I'd suggest actually starting without fretting with the left hand and just with your right hand, go to the 12th fret, touch that with your index finger, touch the 12th fret with your index finger. And then with your A finger, you'll pluck the string. And at the same time you pluck, you want to lift your index up quickly lift your index finger up quickly like that. There we go. Takes a bit of practice to get it really clean, you know, a lot of coordination and there we go. Okay. So artificial harmonics, nice questions there from Frank. So thank you very much. If you have any other questions, um, please let me know. I, I do like, you know, on the spot questions. So, um, but I'll uh, go through a few sort of general questions.
questions now and keep an eye out on that chat. All right. So one question that I often get is how do you, you know, learn a piece from scratch and take it up to a high level? And, you know, when we say a high level, that is a level where it's very fluent, it's very secure technically, there's some, you know, musical, there's interpretation, thought, you know, thought behind the interpretation, you know, it's, it's the, the music's coming to life and it's memorized, you know, that's, that's probably what I would say is like a, a good baseline for, you know, what a, what a, a high level, a high standard that you, that you'd want to aim for when you're learning a new piece. So I think um, a lot of people underestimate how much time it can take to get a piece going to that level, especially if you're performing it or playing it in front of people. So here is a um, sort of process or a framework you can use that you can follow. Um, it's four steps to learning a piece here, four stages for learning a piece. And we go right from scratch stage one where you literally like learning the notes um, right up to stage four where you're performing it by memory and the process takes about four months and this is actually fairly quick so if you if you're very focused I think four months is a good amount of time um, which might surprise some people some you know you might think that sounds like a long time four months you, maybe you're used to just playing something for a couple of weeks and then putting it away and going to the new, you know, going to a new piece. So um, that can be very challenging. You know, if you only have a couple of weeks or even one month to learn a piece and then perform it in front of people, you know, when you learn a piece of music, there's just there's so much to think about. There's so much going on that it's a, it's a bit like slow cooking, you know, like cooking a soup. You can't, there's just, you, you just can't really cook the soup quickly um, it just takes it just takes time so um, let me go through this process a little bit so month one preparation yeah and if you miss any of these steps I, I think it can have you know pretty severe consequences down the track if you miss any of these steps month one listen and study form and structure so listen to the piece. If there are recordings, especially great recordings, I really recommend listening to the piece, getting it in your ear, getting to know it as a piece of music away from the instrument. And listening to multiple interpretations can be really great. Listening to, you know, non, like if it's an arrangement from a piano or orchestra piece or something like that, listen to the original, like listen to the piano, if it's Asturias or something for example, which was originally for the, written for the piano. It's great to listen to the original um, and study the music. Just even a brief study, form and keys. What form is it in? How many sections are there? What keys are each of those sections in? What's the phrase structure? If you just go through and count every four bars, you'll probably get the phrase structure of the piece. I mean, lots of pieces, you know, are not always that simple, but uh, a lot of the times, phrases are four bars long so go through the piece four bars at a time and you might find some patterns and some phrases emerging when you do that what sort of harmonies do you see what sorts of chords do you see any chords you recognize and where is the melody very very important because at the end of the day you know when when it comes down to uh, interpretation and meaning in a, like in a piece of music a lot of that comes from the melody and just projecting the melody above the other parts, especially in guitar music, where we're often getting so many melodies at once. Um, that can be a challenge in Bach, you know, when you go... So many voices that are doing so many things at the same time, it can be challenging to know what to do with those parts. So, so there's the first step in stage one. The second step gets a bit more practical. Map fingerings and positions. Now, a lot of editions of guitar music will have fingerings already. Um, some won't. But what a lot of guitar editions don't have are positions. And this is the key to unlocking 
a lot of learning very quickly, a lot of good learning, because a lot of the fingerings that you do see in additions are based on the position you're in. For example, if you see a B with your third finger, for example, like this, like this kind of thing, that means you're in fifth position. And if there are other notes following that, it's very likely that you'll be in that, that they will be based on that fifth position that's created from the third finger being on the B. Now, positions on guitar refer to the fret that your first finger is on. So if my third finger is on B and it's one finger per fret, so that means my, that's the seventh fret, so fourth finger is on the eighth fret, second is on the sixth, going backwards, and first finger is on the fifth, so that's fifth position. And positions, you know, especially when you're starting to play up higher, in higher positions, they're very, very helpful, you know, that's something like... Something like that, for example. We're starting in the first position, going to the fifth, and here you see at this example where it's the fingering is based on the position one, three, four, and then we get the half bar on the fifth fret. And then we slide up, and then we go back to the fifth fret, and again the fingering is based on the fifth position, and then again for the next bit the fingering is based on the position half bar the fifth fret. Chunking is sort of what I was showing you there where you actually place your fingers um, Down I can just give you an example of this I'm playing Maria Luisa and um, Here it is Maria Luisa so so chunking is where you put the chord shape down before You need all of the notes so you put the chord shape down at the start of the bar so for example, um, if I, from, from this spot here, my left hand is doing that. So I have the chord ready and then I play the notes. Yeah, so if the, the, the opposite of that would be playing these two notes and then putting those two notes down next. And you can see that's more in, that's less efficient than if you put the chord shape down. Chunking also starts to reveal chords and harmony because Aguado said this that um, guitar music is founded on chords <coughs> excuse me I'll say that again guitar music is founded on chords that's what Aguado said and uh, if you if you look at his method books he uh, he was pretty big on learning chords he has lots of progressions and you know intervals and and studies and all sorts of things that that are um, helping a guitarist learn chords so Guitar music is founded on chords, and that's where chunking can be helpful. It can also make your technique more efficient. It can help you to see chord shapes in guitar pieces. Um, another cool thing about chunking and chord shapes is that often chord shapes will be movable. So this chord shape here, we've got this A in the bass. So it's A minor with A in the bass. Um, but if I take, if I don't play that open string, movable chords you usually don't have open strings. So if I just take that pattern and I move that, this is a very common one. The same chord shape with E in the bass that actually comes in later in Maria Luisa over here. The that's actually a typo. It should say ninth position. There, that's the ninth position. My first finger is on the ninth fret. So, so there are movable chord shapes um, in guitar pieces. That chord shape also occurs here in the second position. The same chord shape in the fifth position with A in the bass over here in the second position. And then later on in the ninth position, it's the same chord shape. So you can see how if you start to see chord shapes, it can make your technique more efficient and it can make your reading more efficient too so anyway I'm going through this very <laughs> very slowly um, rhythm so you know are you comfortable with the rhythm if not try to group the rhythm now I click if I click on this it will bring up this chart here 
and this is from this was um, something I created and then I had the help of a student of CCG David Hull who um, added these numbers and time words to it down the bottom so this is a concept where where rhythm is grouped sort of like how individual notes are grouped into chords rhythms can be grouped into groups and these groups you find again and again in in pieces of music so if you're familiar and fluent with the groups and you're able to identify group rhythmic groups <clears throat> excuse me rhythm groups it um it can take away some of the challenge of reading rhythm because you know reading rhythm is often very challenging especially for guitarists um we, we tend to play alone you know we don't play ensemble music as much as many other instruments do so um this can be an area where we can struggle a little bit but grouping rhythms can be very very helpful so that this shows you for example you know you might get s9 which sounds like this right so I could I mean I could do a whole session just on rhythm rhythm grouping there's a lot there subdividing is also very helpful probably a bit more of an obvious an obvious um, approach there subdivide the beat it can be a little bit um, abstract and a little bit tedious to do that especially if you're dealing with rhythms like this because these are what I'd call the most common rhythms in music. So when you have rhythms outside of that, then you might want to um, subdivide. And then this is a step that a lot of people miss out, even though we all know we should do it, is to use the metronome. Play with the metronome. I'm gonna do it right now because to practice, practice what I preach, uh, why don't I play a bit of the Bach piece Use this metronome. Now, people might have questions about the metronome. Um, I use one called Sound Brenner, and it's free. Um, so it looks like that. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Um, what I like about these metronomes is, you see there's a tap button there in the corner. Tap button down there. So I can tap the tempo I want. I'm um, thinking of the Bach prelude I played earlier. Mm, da, da, dum, bum, ba, dum, mm, bum. And it gives me that tempo. Very helpful. So now I can play. So very, very, you know, it's it's like one of the basics, basic things we can do, foundations of practice. A lot of people just, we just neglect it. Um, so, you know, try to keep your metronome close by and uh, use it when you're practicing a piece. Really important. Oh, we've got some other questions as well. I'll finish though talking about this chart. I could spend a long time, a long time talking about this. As you can see, I've just covered stage one. So stage two, I'll just talk through the rest really briefly. So that would be a month, by the way, preparation for one month. Yeah. So yeah, it's a decent amount of time to to really get the structure, listen to it, study it, put the fig like right in the fingerings and the positions. You want to actually write in the positions of at all times. You know what position you're in at all times. And then the rhythms, you might want to group the rhythms, subdivide and use the metronome, just bits and pieces, you know, play it in bits and pieces with the metronome. Then stage two, consolidation. This is where the piece is starting to, you know, you come together a little bit, you know, you've, you've, you can maybe you can play through, you can play most of like bits and pieces, most of it scattered throughout the piece. But now you want to start putting it, you know, making it a whole through consolidation. So you want to use some practice methods, divide and conquer, you know, just practice little bits uh, at a time. I like to say that um, it's better to make 
a lot of progress on a little material than it is to make little progress on a lot of material. So if you practice a whole piece, but you make just a tiny bit of progress, which is probably unlikely, you're probably going to go downhill if you practice a whole piece straight away. Um, but let's say you do make a tiny bit of progress. It's okay. But if you practice a couple of bars and make a lot of progress, that's great. Practice, you know, I think the goal of practice should be progress. Uh, and I've got some other practice methods. I have, I have to move on because there's so I want to talk about so many things. Interpretation. So write in your interpretation what dynamics you want, when you want to change tone color, uh, what rubato, you know, if you want to speed up and slow down, write it all in the score and um, start to run through. Maybe record yourself running through the piece and identify weak spots. I reckon most people get here or even stage one and we'll stop there. So, um, you know, if you get to stage two, your record, let, let's say you can run through the piece, but it's still a bit shaky in certain points and it's not memorized yet. That's, that's probably where a lot of that's like the, the, the peak of what a lot of, um, you know, guitarists would, would get to student guitarists. Anyway, so, so the next stage then is memorization. And that's where you can do things like visualization, left hand only, copy out the score, um, play with your eyes closed, start in random spots. So there are a few ideas there. And then the last stage, performance, actually getting in front of people and performing. Uh, on CCG, my school, the Creative Classical Guitarist, we have weekly masterclasses so that is one opportunity you could take uh, if you have a guitar society or something where, you, where, where they have meetings where you can play. Um, I strongly suggest that just any opportunity you can find to try and actually play in front of people as much as you can. And, you know, your first performance is your first performance. So don't expect your best uh, the first time. Yeah, um, you want to get in front of people multiple times and you'll start to feel more comfortable. I like to think, you know, if you think of some of those concert guitarists like Anna Vidovich or Zhufei Yang, you know, they've, they've probably played some of the pieces that, that they perform. They've probably played them hundreds, if not thousands of times in front of people. Just think about that, you know, how, how, like we see, we see them, they look so comfortable sometimes with, they've been playing some often they've been playing the same pieces for for a long time in front of people even if they're playing new repertoire they have played in front of people probably thousands of times maybe tens of thousands i, I don't know so anyway there's one question that uh, often comes up so got a couple of questions here minor six chords and their function saw it used in source study b minor this is a question from nima yeah thanks thanks for coming on board today nima it's good to see you i hope your composition's going well i know you started uh, a little bit of composing um let me try and find this study for you if i can I know I've um, analyzed it somewhere before. I might not be able to find the analysis right off the top of my head here, but I can at least find the, yeah, I can find the piece itself. I think it's the one, hopefully it's this particular one in B minor. <laughs> and there are a few in B minor that are quite popular. So, um, and your question minor, six minor six chords okay let's see oops um so maybe it's this one i'm not i'm not super sure um <laughs> Maybe you can confirm with me if it's this one. Um, now a minor six 
chord. I think that's maybe a bit more of a jazz term. I'm trying to piece together what that might be. But if we have D, if we have a B minor chord and we add we add a minor sixth to it, is that B C D E F G? Is that what it is? I'm not sure what a minor sixth chord, an M six chord is. Um, it's terminology that's that I'm just not connecting the dots with at the moment. Um, what I can tell you about this piece is that it mostly uses, like most um, tonal pieces, it's mostly based on the primary chords. So the primary chords are one, four, five. So if we go B minor is the one chord, then B, C, D, E minor is the four chord, and B, C, D, E, F sharp is the five chord or F sharp seven. And, um, you know, that, that's B minor, that's F sharp seven, so that's the five, that's B minor. So you go one, five, one, that's five again, F sharp seven, and then that's one, that's five, and that's five as well. So the first eight bars, which is the first, sort of like the first phrase, well, it's actually the question. Um, the first section, this is the A section, this is called a parallel period. We've got eight bar, uh, eight bar question, followed by an eight bar answer. And the answer starts off with the same material as the question. So it's called a parallel period. And so the first eight bars, um, we're just seeing the tonic and dominant one and five chords. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake there. There's, there is a four chord there. Yeah, this one. This is a four chord. That's a subdominant. So that's four. So the first eight bars are made up of the primary chords B minor, E minor, F sharp, F sharp or F sharp seven. F sharp seven, B minor, F sharp seven. minor five chord which leaves the phrase open answer B minor F sharp seven this is G major G major is like a substitute for E minor because E minor is E G B you add a third above that you get a D and there's G, B, D, which is the G major chord. E minor is four, G major is six. So they substitute for each other very well. And then we get a chord that's functioning like the five chord. I can't talk about substitutions too much, but basically what I'm trying to show here is that um, harmony in tonal music is all derived from the primary chords. I can pretty much any piece of music that's tonal, like pre 1900s, I can I can relate it back to the primary chords somehow. Um, B minor, F sharp, B minor. So it's all mostly tonic and dominant. There's one, that's five, and that's one, and that finishes the parallel period there. And um, so there's only two subdominant chords there that one and that one now let me check if this is actually the piece you're referring to <laughs> otherwise i'm talking about something that's um not relevant to you is this the one d so study b minor okay um d a b f all right so with chords, I usually like to stack them in thirds. So D, F, A, and then B, I think. So B, D, F, A, yeah. All right, so this is a sort of a chord substitution um, type of thing here as well. Um, chords can be quite fluid. So if we've got um, D, F, A, that's D minor, stacked in thirds. If we add B to it, um, 
that D to B is a sixth. So that's what that's what you mean by minus six. Now I've got you. Yeah. So that's a minus six. Yeah. Um, if you put the B below, that would that would actually be um, a chord stacked in thirds, and it would be a B half diminished seventh chord. It would sound like this. Yeah. Uh, if we did D minor with a B, you might something like that. So you can think of it in a couple of ways. It's like a minor sixth chord in classical music would probably be this sixth would probably resolve down to the five. That's probably what you're going to see. That's a very common, that's sometimes called a passing tone or a tendency tone. Um, so you'd often get the B on top and then it will resolve down. That's how it would typically function. Otherwise, if it's a chord in its own right, it will probably be functioning like B half diminished seventh with the B at the bottom, B, D, F, A natural. Half diminished seventh, we've got a minor third, another minor third, and then a major third on the top. Um, a fully diminished seventh would have another minor third on the top as well, and would sound like this. Um, drama with the uh, half diminished seventh a bit more mis mystery perhaps so no, yeah good question thank you um, I'll just check if we have any other questions here all right Thank you. So from Frank Carulli's Rondo. Okay, I'm not going to be able to find that too fast. Um, I can email you, Frank. Yep, for sure. All right. Let me know if you got any questions. I really enjoy answering questions on the on the go. But um, next, I want to talk about tremolo because a lot of guitarists often ask me about tremolo and you know how can you get started with uh, tremolo so here is a really great way to get started the tricky thing about tremolo is that most tremolo pieces that we know are very very difficult they're multiple pages long if you think of recuerdos you know Yeah, it's pretty significantly long and you've got a lot of big chunky chords with the left hand, a lot of barring, a lot of shifting, a lot of high positions, a lot of tremolo on the second string. It's not a good piece to start tremolo with, honestly. Um, same with uh, Una Limos na por el de Dios. This one. Very you know, pretty much the same story. It's a bit, maybe a little bit shorter, but in terms of the technical difficulty of the left hand, it's way up there. You know, it's like goes all over the place with the left hand. So it's not a good tremolo piece to start with. So what I recommend you do instead is take this one, this piece, etude in E minor, which a lot of people know and love. tremolo piece it's much more approachable that way um, it sounds I think it sounds beautiful it's a really great stepping stone to towards you know the more challenging tremolo pieces um so uh that's the suggestion i have just you know you can find this very easily online just write 
etude in E minor by Tarraga and then and then learn it as it is written and then you just instead of playing this arpeggio pattern you play a tremolo pattern so that's a question about um, tremolo that I often I often get that no other questions at the moment so um, let me go on to we've talked about chunking we've talked about learning pieces I want to talk about um, technical work and um, I guess warming up specifically so the way I like to warm up is by using scales that's like if I especially if I had to do a fairly quick warm-up and I, I think for me scales um, just make my hands feel like like the like they're warmed up the they're the best exercise for my hands to feel warmed up with let me put it that way um, I think Segovia said about scales that you can solve the greatest number of technical difficulties in the shortest amount of time with scales he recommended guitarists practice scales for two hours a day and um, <laughs> I know especially in this busy day and age I don't think many people would have the time to do that but I would recommend that you commit at least a little bit of time every time you practice every time you pick up your guitar devote a little bit of time to scale playing and I want to show you this is a resource you can purchase this um, on uh, the uh, creative classical guitarist um, dot com um, in the bookstore, the CCG publishing store. Uh, so it gives you these scales here that I find really nice. They're very natural. They they were written by Mertz in his in his um, guitar school in his method book, and you know, there's a lot of a lot of great things about them. They're quite open. You don't get you know, like closed, um, movable patterns. They're quite natural, o organic, and open. Um, so, for example, C major sounds like this. And then we get this beautiful chord progression at the end. a great warm-up because you do a bit of scale playing a bit of chord playing and it's beautiful sounds nice um, so that these are some scales I recommend you get you can find Mertz's guitar school if you search Mertz guitar school uh, it is public domain so you can find it but I kind of made it a bit neater and I added some extra things to this book such as fingerings um, obviously you can do your standard fingerings I also suggest trying out some non-standard fingerings like um, thumb and pinky, for example. Have a look at this, thumb and pinky. So, okay. oh. Try that a bit faster. Very good to develop your pinky and your thumb, controlling those two fingers. So you can try using your thumb and using your pinky. Those I call non-standard fingerings. Um, so another thing about the book, well, sorry, about the scales, I should say, uh, is the rhythm. If you look at some scales, like Segovia scales, for example, they're written in crotchets. They're written in quarter notes, so like... okay it's just fine but I really like having this rhythm it gives it a bit of life um, a bit of rhythmic variety and it's what I call a burst rhythm because you stop and start you it's like interval training you stop and then you flow stop and then So it's that stopping and start, it's that kind of um, burst, that burst rhythm is very uh, good for warming up, it's very good for speed development, it's very good for hand coordination. 
it allows you to find a faster tempo more easily because you can stop and start rather than just this continuous like that. You're very rare to find passages in pieces where scales occur that way. And I do give a bit of more information about that um, down here. So scales, um, here we go. So burst rhythms, I've, I've got a few rhythms you can practice here. So A is like the same as what Mertz has. B sounds like this. C. And D. So there's a bit of variety there. You get you know, triplets and just your, your standard rhythms there. Um, I've got some, you know, bit of advice about what you can focus on, some examples of scale bursts that occur in pieces. So these are some pieces here, you get scale bursts. Um, and then there's some other stuff you can practice too, dynamics, getting louder and softer, playing at different volumes, different articulations, and different emphasis, and different tone colors. So you could do like, you know, Soft and tasto, or you can do loud. <laughs> loud and ponticello, you could do any, you know, whatever you like, loud and normal. Um, I've, I've broken it down into five plucking regions, which is based on uh, what I found in a method book by Katarina or Sydney Pratton. So there's a little bit on you know, scale, playing, warming up. You can find this book. Um, so uh, yeah, I mentioned where you can find the book. Um, another place you can find the book is if you join my either my online school, which is called the Creative Classical Guitarist. Um, so I'll show you that up here. So this is the Creative Classical Guitarist and there's tons of stuff here. Um, basically it's a community of creative classical guitarists who are, you know, continuously composing and arranging and learning about harmony and also improving their performance skills, sharpening their technique, sharpening their practice. We have monthly composition challenges, all sorts of things. But you know, if I just write the word scales here, we'll probably see, we'll see everything relating to scales. <laughs> so there's, you know, just about anything to do with scales there. Um, if I write Mertz, hopefully we'll find, it will filter out. There we go. So major and minor scales by Johann Kasper Mertz. So you can download it there. So you can join um, CCG, the Creative Classical Guitarist. That's one way to access these eBooks. Um, another way is if you, you know, th this is pretty intense, intensive. You know, there's like a lot going on, a lot of workshops every week, and it's quite a, it's quite a commitment. You know, if if that if if you are a committed guitarist, it's probably just right. But if you're not so, you know, super committed and you don't have a lot of time. You can join my Patreon page. Um, I just started this recently. I've got one patron, so I'm very thankful for that to have already have one patron. Um, but you get access to um, all of my eBooks if you become a patron. Um, but you, that would be, I think it's the third level, uh, which is $30 a month. So, sorry, let me go to that. Um, if I go here, I do post lots of stuff as you just saw there. Um, I do post a lot of things um, very regularly. Um, but yeah, that's the, um, uh, that's the, where's that to trying to find, there we go. So there's three tiers, $5 a month. You get uh, scores, I've created a library of some scores and um, some audio, some uh, audio you can listen to, recordings you can listen to. So that's $5 a month. And then $10 a month, we've got 
monthly Q and A recording. So I'm going to do this every month. Um, you can get the recording for ten dollars a month. You get some work workshop recordings, um, plus the library of scores and recordings. And then thirty dollars a month, you get live Q and A like we're doing now. So you can actually ask me questions on the spot. Um, uh, I'm happy to do an analysis analysis video if you want to. Um, Rec suggest a, an, a piece that you want analyzed. I'm happy to do that. You get the workshop recordings. You get access to all of my eBooks um, and the library of scores and recordings. So that's $30 a month. So um, I just wanted to point that's another way to get the book. Um, or if you're really interested in just getting the book itself, you can go to creativeclassicalguitarist.com and go to the store and um, go to eBooks and you'll find it there major and minor scales. Um, there's also a whole bunch of other things you might be interested in um, here as well. So anyway, that's, we're sort of run, starting to run out of time. Let me check how we're going here with the questions. No other questions. Okay. No other questions so far. Let me check in other places if I've got some other questions. Coming up. Don't think so. All right, it's all good. All right, so um, one more, I guess one more thing we could cover. Let's talk about, we've covered harmony already. So I think I'll, I'll cover practicing as the final thing, because this is probably something that um, will impact any guitarist, uh, whatever style, whatever level. Um, I, I've, I created this book called 12 Practice Methods for Guitarists, and basically it distills um, the practice methods that I've used and taught over over my you know career um, into one very concise book because each practice method just takes a page. I wanted to keep it as concise as possible. So, what are some ways to practice? You know, it's really important when you practice. You know, how you practice is is probably the the number the thing that will impact the quality of your playing the most. You know how you practice second to that might be how much you practice but if you practice a lot but the quality of your practice isn't so good it's not going to be as good as less practice of higher quality basically quality over quantity the ideal is that you practice quality and quantity i think if you can practice a lot and it's quality practice that's your ideal place but if you don't have the time you want to make sure your the practice you do have is uh, the highest quality possible. And um, what does high quality practice mean exactly? I think that you're, you're very intentional and very thoughtful about your practice. Um, you're going to be in a, a good, happy, creative state. So you're not going to be in a um, negative state. You're going to be enjoying yourself Enjoyment is absolutely key to good practice. So you're going to be thoughtful, you're going to enjoy your practice, and you're going to be creative with your practice, meaning you're going to break up the music in different ways, you're going to engage different senses, uh, different skills, <clears throat> you're going to engage different parts of your technique and different parts of your playing. Um, so, you know, I. I these 12 methods, you know, I think encourage you in, to develop, to, um, yeah, to develop and nurture those aspects, right? So we're thoughtful, we to be very thoughtful, intentional. Um, we're going to be enjoying ourselves and we're going to be creative. Okay, so just three general points to try and think about. So I'm not going to go through all of these practice methods because there are 12, but 
I'll just kind of zip through all of them just to give you a very quick overview. So divide and conquer, you just take a little bit of a, a passage. You can do things like analyze the music, work out the best fingerings, nail the rhythm, get the rhythm tight, use a metronome, get the balance right, think about the dynamics, memorize it, work on good technique. Okay, so you can imagine how challenging that is to do for an entire piece from start to finish. But if you do it for a bar or two bars, especially if it's a new piece, you're much more likely to have a lot of success and be enjoying yourself. Because if you try to do all of that for a whole piece, your level of enjoyment might be going down quite a bit. So you should be, you can and should be making a lot of progress very quickly. Your progress should be measurable in span of minutes. You should be seeing, feeling, hearing progress in a matter of minutes. Practice at the seams is where you practice in between sections. So like the transitions from one bar to another or the transitions from one section to another. That's what practice at the seams means. I'm highlighting this because most of us neglect those areas. We usually will practice one bar or one phrase or one section, and then we'll go to the next one and we forget the transition. Mix and match, you just start your practice in different places. It's pretty much as simple as that because we tend to practice from the start all the time. And that means the start is strong. And then as you get further and further into the piece, it degrades more and more. So you wanna to try to um, give equal attention to the whole piece by doing mix and match, starting at different places. Sometimes you can start at the end, sometimes you can start in the middle, sometimes you can start in the middle of a phrase, just, you know, you can keep, your, keep yourself on your toes doing that. Slow practice, very, very crucial one. We all probably know about this one, slow practice. How do you practice slow? Because when I ask people to play something slowly, it's virtually the same as the normal tempo. So um, there's a little trick you can do, which is where you imagine the music is notated in uh, much slower note value. So if it's written like this, for example, Well, what if it was, imagine if it was written with these note values. One, two, three, one. Oops. Now you're slow, no doubt about it. Okay, so that's just a little trick. And there are other things I've written there too. Looping, very important that just like a hammer and nail, you're not gonna get the nail in just with one strike. You need to strike that nail a few times. So you know, looping is, is the sort of equivalent of that. Um, looping is really like a way to solidify. And there's a saying that I really like, um, uh, amateur practices until they get it right and a professional practices until they can't get it wrong. And so it's that going those extra few repetitions, looping, um, you know, hitting the nail in one or two extra times to make sure it's really in properly. That's a, that's good. You know, that's a that's a good thing to do in your practice. That just helps excel and elevate, helps to elevate your practice and helps you to excel in your playing. 80, 20, it's possible a lot of the time to simplify by taking out repetitions, identifying repetitions and taking them out, you can save a lot of time in your practice. There are often phrases or sometimes entire sections that repeat. It's not, if you have limited time, it's not useful to always repeat those repeating sections. So focus on the different sections and try to ignore the repeats. You can save a lot of time in your practice. Left hand only, I just use your left hand only. Mute the strings you take away sounds and I've got some points you can focus on muscle memory, self check, less tension, decrease the tension, hear the music, even though the sound is gone, uh, refine your technique, fix tough spots. There's lots of things you can focus on. Try practicing a scale with your left hand only. It's strange at first, but you can, you can really start to focus on things 
you know, these new things will start to stand out when you do that, that you wouldn't notice normally when you're using your right hand. Once you've done left hand only, try your right hand only. Um, it's a very similar thing. What's your tone like? How are your dynamics sounding? How's your rhythm? Rhythm primarily comes from the right hand. What's your hand position like? Number nine, separate the parts. So is there a melody and an accompaniment? Most likely if you're playing guitar music, play them individually. So this, right? We've got a melody and an accompaniment. The melody sounds like this, oops. The accompaniment. I'm willing to bet you heard it differently that time than the very first time I played it because when you hear the separate parts and then you put them back together again you become much more aware of all of the layers in the music and how they interact with each other sing so you can you can learn a lot. Singing helps you to internalize music a lot um, and, and, and understand it on a deeper level, a much deeper level. It's almost a bit mysterious, like when you sing something, how you start to understand it. Um, so you can derive intervals from the music you're playing. So for example, we could, we could look vertically at the first interval. There we go. <laughs> so that's a sixth there. So I'm singing a sixth. It's directly um, related to what I'm playing. And so it's a very good way to just, just even doing that one interval, singing a sixth, you, you know, it's great. Rhythm, you can practice the rhythm only just take the rhythm of a piece and practice that, especially in the spots that are trickier. You can do this by um, tapping, or you could play play the piece, you know, the right hand only method can be good for this too, because you're actually, in some ways, you're playing the rhythm only, but you're hearing, you're articulating, you're getting some sound on the instrument, making it, re relating it to the guitar. And the final one, visualization. So practicing the music away from your instrument and in your mind. So um, basically what I'm recommending here is probably the most intensive form of visualization where you get some blank manuscript and from by memory, you write out the piece that you're learning from memory. Very, very intensive way to test your memory and to work and refine your memory. If you want a bit of a stepping stone to that, you can copy out a score. And that's actually how a lot of composers, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, etc., learnt about composition and learnt about music was by copying scores. I think I have the, there's a quote here about that, that um, such a proceeding frequently repeated the pupil in learning to exercise his ear through his sight will gradually form his style, his feeling, and his taste. So those are the, <laughs> you know, take a breath here. That was, that was a quick, very, very quick overview of the 12 practice methods. Um, this is another book you can get by becoming a patron or joining CCG or checking out the CCG store. Um, you can get this book and all all of my ebooks, and um, I hope that was helpful. See if there are any final questions. No final questions. Well, I think I'll um, I'll wrap it up there. So, thank you very much for watching and for joining, and um, I hope to uh, you know have some further contact with you. If you have any questions please, you know, shoot me a message or an email if you have my email. Um, or you can become a patron. You can ask me questions directly there and, and I'll, um, you know, 
be able to give you and other patrons uh, a response. And I think when, when one person has a question, I'm sure that many others have the same question. So it's, I think it's really nice to kind of share the answers to your questions. And so I would like to keep this um, Q and A going each month as well. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining. I wish you all the best in your guitar playing, guitar practice. And um, until next time, thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.